Yeah, welcome to our CGS colloquium today. I am Junko Habu, the chair of the Center for Japanese Studies at UC Berkeley and professor of anthropology. Today's presentation is titled Uptown and Downtown in Early Modern Japanese Urban Literature, the making of a three volume anthology. I'm delighted to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Sumir Jones, Professor Emerita of Comparative Literature and East Asian Languages and Cultures at Indiana University, Bloomington. Professor Jones is a specialist of 18th and 19th century literature and arts, East and West, as well as Japan's literary, pictorial, and the performed arts of the Edo period, 16. 100 to 1868 and the Meiji period, 1868 to 1912. Dr. Jones is the recipient of the 2019 Lindsley and the Masao Miyoshi Lifetime Achievement Prize in translation and editing of, uh, <clears throat> editing of translation, Donald Keen Center of Japanese Studies, Columbia University. She has recently moved to Albany, close to her family members. And I was delighted to hear from her earlier this year when she told me that she would like to be admitted to the CGS com community and get involved in our event. So we asked her if she could give a talk for us and uh, she agreed to give this very exciting talk for us today. I am also honored to welcome Professor Michael Emery, um, Tadashi ya <clears throat> Yanai Professor of Japanese Literature at UCLA as our discussant and moderator today. Professor Jones will first give her talk for about 40 minutes. And you can submit questions at any point during the talk using the Q&A function. Please do not put your question um, in the chat section. And if you do so, um, our program coordinator will ask you to rewrite your question in the Q&A section. So uh, please welcome Professor Jones. Thank you, Junko. Uh, I am grateful to um, you and uh, Kumi, who has helped me daily on this, and uh, the uh, Center for Japanese Studies at the UC Berkeley. I am honored to give this talk. Um, uh, I have to apologize that the, uh, my, uh, because of my allergies, my hearing isn't very good, and my voice is sort of, uh, squeaky horse, so it's hard on uh, on the audience, but I think they are compensated by uh, lively and brilliant remarks by Michael Emery and, and by uh, great pictures I will show. Uh, the title, Uptown and Downtown, is a bit misleading because the, the whole concept of uptown and downtown didn't come in until the Meiji period. Meiji Tokyo divided the highly educated and the not so educated uh, geographically. But that wasn't true in the Edo period, but please take it metaphorically, so to speak, uh, so that we are talking about the highbrow and middlebrow and the lowbrow uh, arts. So I'm talking about those three uh, separate volumes of the anthology, a Kamigata anthology um, for the early Edo period, an Edo anthology for the later Edo period, and a Tokyo anthology to cover the Meiji uh, period. And uh, let me tell you, number one, that I will not have the time to mention a lot of genius works 
that uh, in the um, in this anthology <coughs> because of uh, the time limit and also remind you that it's about the making of the anthology it's it's not so much about the anthology itself but it's about the making you know uh, Kurosawa Akira's uh, making of he loved to make uh, films and to talk about the making of every film that he made um, he uh, he was notorious for taking very long uh, because he paid so much uh, attention to details but also because he worked with so many people at the same time so many horses also uh, and so uh, uh, his sponsors were always nervous about this well in my case the granting agents were always um, nervous about how long it was taken it has taken all 16 years and uh, we too paid a lot of attention to details and we too have so many people about 70 people involved in the translation and editing of, uh, of this anthology and of course the uh, comparison with Kurosawa ends there uh, the uh, the anthology has been reviewed by uh, individually in uh, various uh, journals and the newspapers and uh, uh, I am showing this because this is the first um, review of the entire set of three volumes um, by Professor Kinugasa Masaki. Um, and uh, this issue is about to be pub to come out. It's not out yet. They just have the cover now. And uh, you see here, uh, volume number 107 in which you have this uh, uh, long review article in in English of the uh, the three uh, volumes this journal by the way uh, edited by the University of Tokyo Comparative Literature Society uh, which is huge including uh, former graduates, uh, current faculty, uh, students, and a lot of friends, international friends. And uh, so this journal is the leading journal in Japan of our discipline. Um, the biggest question is, why did you have to do this? Do this when Haruo Shirane had this wonderful um, anthology already. Well, it started out this way. Haruo and I exchanged the uh, uh, possible table of contents for what we were rumored to be preparing. Haruo at the, at the time was thinking of an anthology beginning with Kojiki, ending with current literature and uh, mine was focused on the later Edo period that's what I was studying and uh, I am proud to think that I had some influence on his choice of focusing on the Edo period but he came up with uh, one volume um, anthology covering from 1600 to the end of Meiji period, 1912, uh, and covering all sorts of genres, uh, nicely organized in chronological order and also according to genres. Uh, uh, the ratio of higher uh, culture is larger in Haruo's anthology, the mind which tended to be a quirky sort of anthology. Um, 
Haru's, Haru's contribution was enormous because um, it made available a huge number of works from the Edo period. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge uh, John Salt's work in coming up with those uh, tiny little uh, volumes of an anthology in honor of Howard Hibbett, his, his teacher, at his retirement. So this took 10 years to, to, to make, but it's a uh, cute individual volume for an individual work. Um, translators uh, from, the, um, from Howard Hibbett's group, which I'll mention later. Um, so the high and low, uh, let's understand uh, this way. Uh, there are highbrow writings, and uh, these are uh, essentially by and for samurai, clergy, and uh, educated commoners. And the uh, middle uh, uh, Gazoku Konko, high and low mixed, um, is, uh, uh, includes all sorts of things that to make Edo as a city uh, more interesting. Uh, and uh, you have all the forms and the genres listed here. And these mix uh, are mixed because a lot of parody um, uh, was dominating. And uh, then you have lowbrow writings that uh, shows up later in the late Edo period and uh, through Meiji period. And, uh, and this answer to the uh, desire of the common market. And they always want stories, long stories. And they want love and sex. And they want ghosts and monsters. And so um, the, particularly the genre called Gokan, uh, combined volumes um, uh, was very uh, popular. So now uh, I want to show you some examples. The high is something like this. And this, uh, uh, as you can see, is from originally a hand scroll, which was uh, cut into, into panels and uh, uh, collected by uh, Takahashi Toru, uh, who is a collector of a lot of um, uh, Edo, me medieval and Edo arts that are based on classics. And you have those fun pictures of, uh, 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 this is a 12 zodiac poets. So the uh, zodiac animal, is represented as a poet, and you have that poet's poem uh, about it as a, as a picture. And this is an example of mixed. Um, it's a it's the, the street walker who is um, giving this polemic against the high class Yoshiwara, the only government licensed pleasure quarters. And uh, uh, this is written as a sort of Taoist text. It's an intellectual uh, text, essay form, or uh, 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 thesis form. And this is translated hilariously by Robert Campbell. And uh, so this has the high and the low mixed. The high is the Taoist text of the, of the period. And the, the low, of course, is prostitution. And another mixed example is this comes from the Meiji uh, period. And here is the uh, horse and the ox. Uh, having a discussion 
about their roles in the modernity of Japan. And of course, o ox is uh, dressed as a Western person because the beef is something that the Japanese started to eat then. So it was very fashionable. It was a Western thing to do. And of course, a horse is depicted as an old fashioned low class Edoite because he's <laughs> not being used for that way. Uh, but he, he, he uh, argues for his cause, that's okay. And something that's low, we have uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, ghost and monster stories. And this one translated by Matthew Freire is a, a wonderful collection, 100 stories. Uh, and uh, here is a, a ghost upside down, uh, gets a, uh, uh, takes a boat ride uh, standing upside down. Uh, this kind of uh, stories, these are humorous, but they run for um, uh, eros, scatology, sex, uh, crime, and things like that. And this is raw. Uh, this comes very late. And uh, here's this uh, wonderful uh, murder scene. And uh, this comes from the so called Ninjo Banashi, um, human life stories um, in uh, late Edo period. These are prolonged version of Lakuro. And these are not funny stories, they're just long stories. People came day in, day out um, to get, to get the, uh, the, the sequence. And uh, uh, so the taste runs into that kind of direction, the desire for violence, death, uh, revenge, and uh, things like that. And this, of course, those stories are not uh, uh, printed, uh, let alone illustrated, but thanks to those, um, what is the fast writing? Stenograph, stenography. Uh, thanks to the development of stenography, those stories were written down during the Meiji period and this, and. Uh, published in newspapers and things like that. And so this, here it is. And uh, the, uh, we think it's so clever to divide the whole thing into three volumes this way, uh, because the early Edo period, Kamigata was the uh, uh, center of culture in all sorts of ways. Sake was better in Osaka than in Edo. Uh, kimono is better, made better in Kyoto. And of course, all books were published in Kyoto and Osaka. And so the Edo citizens until uh, uh, mid 18th century were simply consumers of those imported goods from superior parts of Japan. So uh, in fact, uh, people said, uh, Kyo e noboru, go up to Kyoto. And the Kyotoites said, go down to Edo. And so, uh, so this is, we, uh, we can neatly, uh, we could neatly arrange uh, uh, a volume dedicated to that period. So this is coming at a centered uh, literature and the arts. And then late Edo period, when Edo, uh, city of Edo that was built in the boondocks was now ready to be productive. So they started their own forms and the genres of uh, uh, everything, including books. And so uh, this is the middle uh, period and neatly fit in the Edo volume. And then of course, Meiji is a totally different uh, period 
uh, as Edo turned into Tokyo under the new uh, government, parliamentary imperialism, and all this. So uh, it was a very modern uh, period. But a lot of things were, were inherited from earlier Edo period, and a lot were uh, invented. And of course, the influence of Western <coughs> civilization that came in was quite strong. Uh, I won't have the time to be reading all these names, but the, uh, the group started with um, Howard Hibbett's uh, seminar with his students, former students, uh, students of the time, and the people who, like me, who joined later. And that they are the core of the people who did the mutual study of Gesaku, the late Edo comical literature, uh, who uh, turned into the group that produced the anthology. And uh, we had, uh, I had preliminary discussions long before that uh, in Tokyo with those people who were in, in Tokyo. They were Tokyoites and, and uh, Americans who were settled there. And then later, we had volume planning uh, uh, committees for individual uh, volumes. Uh, we met many, many times at all sorts of different places. So I may not remember all of the people who are involved in uh, planning committee meetings, but I would like to acknowledge Sharon Yamamoto, uh, who was a University of Chicago editor who uh, looked me up and asked me to um, compile an anthology uh, on the basis of her reading of my dissertation. And, uh, and that's how an idea uh, started. And it went back to the Hibbit group for uh, realistic thinking. Uh, Sharon uh, moved to, uh, to Hawaii to take care of her mother uh, so that uh, uh, she took the project to Hawaii from Chicago. And uh, uh, since then, uh, and uh, unfortunately, Sharon passed away very soon uh, from cancer. And so it was taken over by Pam Kelly, who uh, took care of us for many, many years um, until the, the new uh, editors took over. Now, translations, uh, there are all sorts of theories of translation. I'm one of the theorists, but uh, there are kinds of translations that we can think of. First, we have a scholarly translation, which tries to be accurate uh, depending on all the words and facts that are contained in the original. And so, uh, so scholarly translation sometimes don't have much regard for the reader. And then we have artistic translation, which tries to please the, uh, the reader uh, by polishing up the style and getting the tone uh, of the original and all this. And the transparent translation, another idea which was thought to be good that this translation is so, so good that you see the original through it. And of course, later we said, wait a minute, that's not a good translation uh, uh, on it, on it, as, as, a, as literature on its own. And of course, so we say, well, translation is opaque because it's a created work. Uh, then, there are considerations for two types of translations. That is writer-friendly translation and reader-friendly translation. And writer-friendly, of course, wants to be faithful to the original. Uh, 
word to word if possible. And the reader friendly translation uh, may depart in order to convey the right kind of tone, right kind of rhythm. And so, uh, uh, so these are two very different translations. And uh, uh, the bottom one, over textual translation, is what I invented. I mean, the idea that I invented. And that is when you come to a, a literary work in the original, the, the text already consists of various layers of its history, uh, interpretations, explanations, and uh, influences, and whatnot. And uh, the reader brings her, his layers of text inside uh, the self. And, and uh, through readings, through education, and uh, 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 comparative comparisons with other works that one does. And so my idea is that the reader is actually putting her layers on top of the original text, which already contains uh, layers. And so uh, the ideal is to go uh, for us is to go a combination of writer friendly, but also reader friendly. And our ideal is to, to sort of recreate uh, uh, situation by the translation in which the reader can feel what the original reader did from the original text. Uh, here's a team of people. Uh, uh, I'm not going to read the names. I don't have the time. Uh, but the, uh, uh, the important thing, editorial board people, uh, uh, Howard did the uh, ultimate stylistic editing, and uh, uh, Nobuhiro Shinji did the uh, uh, checking on all original words, names, and such. The, the we do run into problems all the time. So the first Edo an anthology, uh, uh, the one that was published first, was supposed to be edited by uh, Robert Campbell and me. Uh, Campbell be being the leading uh, disciple of Howard Hibbett and a great uh, editor, but the, he was uh, balancing his intense uh, uh, double careers and uh, being professor at the University of Tokyo and at the same time being the most popular uh, figure in the media. He had this public TV uh, series called J Bungaku, Japanese literature, uh, consisting of interviews, uh, each time discussing one piece of Japanese literature. But that spread into his general appearances in other uh, uh, TV programs, as well as newspaper interviews and whatnot. So he was the busiest man on earth. And so after he started, after he uh, submitted some, um, oh, uh, translations, he could no longer uh, keep up as editor. And uh, I was in tears. And Howard Hibbett said, all right, I, I will take over. I'll do all the copy editing and everything else. And he actually did to the end. But it was very sad for me to, uh, uh, to lose uh, Robert. Uh, so 
So this is the way the, it, the list came out as far as the um, uh, publisher is concerned. And uh, so Kenji Watanabe, because he did not actually edit, he was uh, called uh, Japan advisor. And therefore, instead of and, his name comes with. with. So here is the editing process that I'm not going to explain, but it's a it's a very complicated back and forth movements, and uh, the most complicated thing was that we, uh, as you see, we embedded the verbal text into pictorial text when the when the the book is a graphic thing. And, and that was a large part of the, that was a large part of the, uh, uh, our work, let's go. And so there are those themes, um, because we did not organize the anthology according to chronology or or John's, those chapter names are like this. And uh, and the works uh, were organized accordingly, paying no attention to chronological order. So you have uh, an example of the uh, the kind of a high and low mix, but it's a, uh, this is an example of a, of a hero. And here's an example of a murder scene um, in uh, uh, Saigaku's section. Two great rogues in uh, Kabuki, uh, and this is a, a very funny translation by Dylan McGee on uh, uh, Eight Foot Loose Fools, um, the, when the uh, uh, people who are pretending to be samurai are actually found out by a real one. And the sentimental fiction uh, li like this. These were long uh, novels that were, that were accompanied by pictures. And this is a substantial book of uh, monsters. This is the Miai uh, matrimonial meeting session of monsters. The uglier, uglier the beauty. The uglier, the more beautiful. This is how we tried to put the uh, translations in place of the original uh, verbal text into the picture. Uh, this is a kabuki uh, trick, but I, I I shouldn't explain. It's too, uh, but it's a. Uh, it's a very uh, 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 violent murder story. And this is a, a comical, uh, famous comical story, uh, floating world barbershop, uh, in pair actually with floating world bus house. Uh, translated by Charles Dulles. And this is to show, uh, this is to praise the art of a farting artist. And it's an advertisement for the show. Um, this is interesting, in partic particularly because this is, uh, this is it's a kanshi. 
It's a cynic uh, poetry written in uh, sort of Chinese, a real Chinese, and uh, describing the aforementioned Yoshiwara pleasure quarters. Uh, and so one of the chapters is Landscapes and Seasons. And, and this was translated by Howard Hibbett, but the Saikaku is known usually only as a novelist, but he was a poet uh, famous for his yakazu, kind of a shooting arrows uh, competition. And in one night he could make 100 and that kind of thing. And this is his, his own scroll uh, uh, with the poems, but the Saikaku's own comments after every one of them. And the fun of Howard Hibbett's translation is that he added his comment after Saikaku's. Next. Um, the uh, masterpiece of parody, of course, is uh, its closeness to the original right, that it parodies. And here is the, uh, the no play Takasago and uh, uh, translated by uh, Sherry Feno Quinn. And you'd see how close the, uh, the parody is to uh, the original respectable no play and how close her translation is to the original and the parody. This is where <clears throat> the, the way the love might appear. If you burn your lover's love letters, she would appear in the smoke. And this is one of the fun translations. There are many, but this is a, um, Hiranga uh, Gennai's poem, translated by, by Time on Screech, and it's, it's hilarious all the way through. It's uh, the uh, Laos couple journeying on the human body. There are reportages in this anthology, and this one depicts Shimabara, in the uh, in this uh, travel book translated by Marsha Yonemoto. And this is a, a very famous uh, book on, on the uh, uh, fire of 1657, um, which burnt a huge part of, of, uh, of Edo. And so this is a, a picture of people falling into, into the water and dying there, uh, translated by Harry Smith and Stephen Wells. And this is another reportage of Meiji period by Charles Shiro Inoue, by the author who actually lived in, the, uh, in Sanya and uh, reported what he saw. A triplet of singers I, uh, I put here, I mean, we put in the anthology because there are songs in the uh, uh, anthology and uh, uh, I mentioned Tom Harris and uh, John Salt's translations. These are people who are uh, deceased uh, during or before we launched, launched the, the project. And uh, so in memory, I list those, those people. By the way, uh, University of Hawaii Press has uh, announced that the uh, revised edition of uh, the Edo volume is coming up. They are working on it. 
and they will go on to the other volumes as well. Thank you very much. Okay, well, I will um, be happy to um, take over here for just a few minutes. My name is Michael Emmerich. I teach Japanese literature at UCLA. Um, and first of all, I, I just want to say what an honor it is to have been asked to join in this event. Um, somehow, I've never had the pleasure of meeting Professor, Professor Jones in person, but I've long admired her in a, a sort of mouse gazing up at the moon sort of way, not just as a scholar, an editor and a translator, but also as a model of the best kind of engagement with other scholars and translators whose generosity and curiosity like moonlight are boundless. It also feels a bit daunting to be here since I was asked to talk for five or 10 minutes about this massive three volume anthology about which there's just so much to say. Personally, I'm very interested in hearing the questions everyone has uh, and Professor Jones's responses. So I'm going to try to stay closer to five minutes than to 10. And as a result, I'll limit myself to making just two points that seem to me very important in understanding the nature of what Professor Jones and her numerous collaborators, her co-editors, the editorial board, and of course, all the translators have accomplished. The first point I want to make is, in a sense, so basic that it probably isn't even necessary to make it, but I want to make it anyway. This anthology, each volume of which focuses on a different city in a different time period, is actually when you take it in as a whole, kind of like an inn somewhere along the Tokaido, a very large inn, teeming with people from all kinds of backgrounds, telling stories, sharing poems. And among these people, there are some who are living and many who are dead. The first full date to appear in this anthology is March 13th, 2019, which is the day Howard Hibbett passed away. And it appears in the context of Professor Jones's dedication of the anthology to him. I only met Howard Hibbett once, but he stands out to me even so as a particularly important figure in the post-war history, not just of Japanese literary studies, but of Japanese literature itself. And Professor Jones's touching dedication of the anthology to him seems to me to mark the in-like nature of the project. In a sense, no doubt, any anthology, like any work of scholarship, is the product of generations of accumulated knowledge. But it seems to me that these three volumes radiate a sense of community that is actually quite rare in projects of this sort. I suspect one of the reasons it took 16 years for the anthology to find its way into print may be that Professor Jones, the innkeeper, was such a welcoming and dedicated host. We tend to think of anthologies as engines of canonization that reinforce and sometimes challenge certain values held by educated elites, projecting them into society and into the future. And of course, this is a useful way to think about them. But reading these three volumes, I find myself becoming more attuned to the function books like these play in helping to form and reform the communities of people who come together to make them. The second point I'd like to make is hard for me to express. Perhaps I could begin or I could start by referencing a figure who I valued and whose death I mourn in much the way Professor Jones valued and mourns Howard Hibbett, the thinker and literary critic Kato Norihiro. One of the terms that comes up again and again in Kato Sensei's writing is kagose, which might be translated as the potential for error or the ability to be wrong. In his view, all thought in the sense of thinking about an issue or a problem is predicated on kagose. If you aren't comfortable with the possibility that you might be wrong or with allowing other people to be wrong, you can't get anywhere, you can't grow, you can't develop. I think of this sometimes when I'm translating or reading other people's translations. It is easy to turn to a dictionary when one is translating as the source of an authoritative, correct translation. Frequently, that works just fine. But often, in my experience, really powerful, thought-provoking, and meaningful translations come into being when the translator cuts away from the dictionary and the understanding of language it embodies, pushes off into the rather frightening depths of subjective experience, where she and she alone is responsible for her choices, including those that may, to others, or perhaps even to herself, come to seem erroneous. The same thing is true, I think, or can be, of an anthology. 
I've never come across an authoritative uh, guide to assembling an anthology, but of course there are plenty of conventions that editors tend to follow. Professor Jones talked about, uh, or actually I guess he didn't talk about notes, I thought he was going to talk about notes, but um, but could have, there are no notes in this volume, or in these three volumes. Um, and uh, obviously she chose not to include them. I think it's fair to say that this was the wrong decision. So much is lost on readers when you don't have notes, obviously. Let me give a particular example uh, of something a little different. Um, consider the very first work in the anthology, if we read it chronologically. Uh, the poetic competition of the 12 zodiac animals illustrated by Kano Daigaku Ujinobu, poems attributed to Karasumaru Mitsuhiro. Uh, this is the uh, one of the, the, the uh, early images that uh, Professor Jones showed of the, the snake with the poem um, comes from this piece. Uh, all kinds of odd decisions have been made in presenting this translation. As Takahashi Toru and John Salt's introduction to the piece notes, quote, players in a poetry competition uh, were traditionally grouped into two teams, one on the right and one to the left, or one on the left to mirror the two sides of government. However, for the purpose of this anthology, the 12 poets are instead grouped in the conventional order of the 12 animals of the zodiac. Now, if there were notes, we could have had a bit of explanation here about why this decision was made. Are the 24 separate sheets on which the poems and accompanying pictures appear unnumbered, making it impossible to determine the order in which they ought to appear? Surely one could solve this problem, or at least pretend to have solved it, by following the order of the poems in the scroll on which the piece is based? Either way, one thing we can say with confidence is that the order in which the poems appear here in the anthology is incorrect. They ought at least to alternate between right and left, and yet they are clearly labeled in the reproduced calligraphy as appearing in this order, right, 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 left, 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 right, right. But of course, in order to notice this fact, you have to be able to read the calligraphy, since the sides, right and left, have not been included in the translation. In fact, the headnotes, which give the names of the poets, have been separated from the translations of the poems placed on the facing page, so that it isn't at all uh, clear that they're even part of the translation. They could just be the conventional names of the animals shown in the pictures. And what's more, horror of horrors, the translations of the poems have been printed without romanizations of the Japanese. How on earth are people who can't read Japanese going to read the Japanese? So many mistaken decisions. And I have to say that if I were the publisher of this book, the decision to include all these reproductions of the pictures and the calligraphy, and, uh, or include the decision to include all these re reproductions of the pictures and the calligraphy, and to give each one a full quarter of a page, and to do this for a work so minor, it's all wrong. And yet, yes, these are all legitimate criticisms. I may have sounded a little ironic just now, as though I were merely miming discontent, but part of me actually is discontent. I think all of these really are legitimate criticisms. And yet, Professor Jones and her colleagues knew all this. Hell, Takashi Toru and John Salt actually point out in their introduction that they've dismantled the poetry competition structure of this poetry competition, replacing it with another, quote, for the purposes of this anthology. One might be tempted to see in this decision and in countless others that editors and translators made in the course of the 16 year process of creating this anthology, nothing more than an eagerness to reach a broader audience, a readership less concerned than many academics with issues of the sort I noted just now. I think, however, that one would be wrong to look at this uh, in this way. I have to confess that I love these anthologies. I love reading them. I love using them in classes. And I love them both despite the criticisms I have of them, and more fundamentally, because of the criticisms I have of them. I admire and I'm grateful to Professor Jones and her colleagues for having the bravery to create this anthology in the way they did, knowing full well that they were making, at every level, the wrong choices. And here, the wrong choices is in scare quotes. I find that these three volumes provide reading experiences and fodder for thought and a genuinely valuable intellectual provocation precisely because they are built upon an openness to making what may come across as mistakes, what may even be mistakes. It seems to me there is a real editorial wisdom in this stance. In the end, in translating, 
in editing a giant anthology, in reading literature, or in doing research in the humanities, it is probably better to be open to getting things wrong than it is to believe that there's actually a way to get it all right. Thank you. Thank you very much.